I made a video essay on the 8 Harry Potter films, each with their own topic, and you guys seemed to really enjoy those videos, so now I thought it would be fun to do the same for the Fantastic Beasts films. Amongst Harry Potter fans, the reception of these movies is very divided as to whether or not they're good. I'm not going to talk about the crimes of Grindelwald in this video. Is that how you say it? Grindelwald? I'm not one of Grindelwald's fanatics. So it's pronounced with a W? The defeat of Grindelwald. Two characters said it differently. That is not helpful. Dumbledore and Grindelwald. Okay, so the person who created the character says it like a V, so I'm gonna go with Grindelwald. But anyway, I'm not gonna talk about the crimes of Grindelwald in this video. I'm saving that for its own video, which I'm pretty excited to make. But for now, let's focus on the first film in the series. I had seen this movie three times before watching it for this review, this most recent time being my fourth viewing of the film. And upon the first viewing, when seeing it in theaters, I really enjoyed it. The second time I watched it was for my breakdown on the film way back when. It was like my ninth Harry Potter video after rebooting the channel to Movie Flame. Upon the second viewing, I looked deeply at the film, but not in a review sort of way. It was more of an easter egg and breakdown video, looking at small details that linked it to the original series, and looking at how it compared to the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them book that Rowling released in the early 2000s. I did review a bit in that video, and I actually said some things that I don't entirely agree with anymore, which I'll cover later in the video. Upon the third viewing, I watched it before seeing The Crimes of Grindelwald in theaters, and that was just a casual watch. I didn't look deeply at the story or anything. I basically just watched it as a summary before watching the second movie. Now we get to the fourth viewing. I'm actually embarrassed to say that in recent years, I have allowed the public's view of these movies to alter my opinions on the Fantastic Beast films, and it made me sort of not like them, and I sort of wrote the movies off. I even said in one video that I thought it was unoriginal and that it couldn't stand on its own, an opinion that I no longer have. It had been two years since my last viewing of this film, and if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I actually enjoyed it this time around, as I tweeted saying I forgot how good it was. I took a deeper look at the story, the execution of the film, and even took a deeper look behind the scenes, and I now realize that this movie is actually really good. <laughs> in this video, I'm going to explain why I think that. There are going to be major spoilers for both Fantastic Beast movies, so you have been warned. Now let's get into it. Upon this viewing, I realized that the thing that makes this movie so good is how it differs from the original seven books. To make this movie work, it had to be pretty distant from Harry's story, and Rowling did just that. Instead of kids, we follow adults, giving it a more mature and serious tone. Instead of being safe at Hogwarts, we're out in the real world, which again makes everything more suspenseful. And the biggest difference that is the key to everything, instead of having most of the story take place in the magical world, most of this movie takes place in the muggle world. We really only go to three magical places, Makuza, Newt Suitcase, and the Blind Pig, the underground pub. I've arrested half of the people in here. Also, we see a muggle interact with wizards, which we hadn't really seen before other than the Dursleys, but Fantastic Beast takes this to a whole nother level, and it was really interesting to watch. These differences to the original series might be subtle, but they're very effective to help make this movie stand on its own and away from the original series. This movie has a much different dynamic than Harry's story, and it's able to accomplish this because the groundwork had already been set up in the original seven books. We're already familiar with the Wizarding World, and this allows us to enter this new prequel series in a much different way than we did for Harry's story. One of the reasons why Harry's story worked and why it was so great was because we as an audience accompany him in entering this magical world for the first time. But here, Rowling realized that she could use the audience's familiarity with this world and use it to her advantage. She didn't have to explain every little detail of the world and how everything in that world worked. So we get right into the action, making the beginning of the film much faster in pace. And this is key, because it sets the groundwork for what's to come. This movie holds much more action than the original series, because most of the time in the seven books, we're just chilling at Hogwarts, which is of course amazing, and what made that series so great. But for this movie, we needed something new and fresh, and Rowling set that up perfectly, first seeing these disasters in the newspaper montage compiled with this heart racing score. And on top of that, we get this huge mystery monster just running through the streets and destroying everything. And then we have the high intensity scene of Newt chasing the Niffler through the bank. Right away, it's very suspenseful. Don't shoot, don't shoot. 
But the most brilliant part to this introduction of the story is that though we're familiar with magic and wizards, Rowling was still able to make a story that had us accompany a wizard entering new terrain. In this case, Newt entering the American wizarding world. He's seeing it for the first time, just as we as an audience are seeing it for the first time. This makes us identify with a new wizard who isn't Harry, and right away, we share this journey with Newt. It's the perfect transition from the old protagonist to the new protagonist. From the beginning, I've always loved Newt's character. Even when I wrote these movies off, I thought he was perfect. I made a video on his character and explained why he's the perfect hero for these movies. I did not think that Rowling could write a better protagonist than Harry, but I think Newt is just as good, if not better. And I know that's a bold statement, but let me explain. Newt embodies four different characters from the original series. He's brave like Harry, but unlike Harry, he doesn't have a hero's complex, a constant theme in the original books. Ernest. Newt's smart like Hermione, but he isn't a bossy know-it-all the way she is. Put your hand down, you silly girl. He's also loyal like Ron, but he doesn't have Ron's jealous streak, because unlike Ron, and even Harry for that matter, he does not want the glory for what he does. He's very humble. And on top of all of that, he has Hagrid's love for creatures, which shows his vulnerability and compassion. And I know it seems like I'm bashing on the Golden Trio, but that is in no way what I'm saying. They're perfect the way they are. They all needed their flaws to make their characters work in the original series. Their flaws are part of what makes them so great. But the same can be said for Newt. He needs to have all of these positive qualities to make the Fantastic Beast films work. If the audience doesn't like Newt, it's over. So on paper, you almost need this perfect character. But off paper, he still has huge flaws like everyone else, which is another key aspect when writing a main character. They cannot be perfect. Newt struggles with human interaction very heavily and is incredibly awkward. But Newt's flaw is something that makes people feel for him even more, which can't be said for the Golden Trio's flaws. Their flaws can be kind of annoying. The best example is when Harry has to save the others during the second task of the Triwizard Tournament, even though that was not his mission, and trying to be the hero makes him give up first place. I remember reading that and just being so annoyed. But for Harry's character and for that book, it worked perfectly. But if we look at Newt's fall for being awkward, this is Rowling understanding how important it is to have the audience feel for Newt, and she makes the thing that makes him not perfect one of the qualities that we like best in his character. His awkwardness is cute, funny, and endearing all at the same time. With his social struggles, Newt is more of a solo character than Harry. Sure, he has his friends that go along with him on his journey, but there's a lot more of Newt being on his own when compared to Harry. And it's another thing that separates the Fantastic Beasts series from the Harry Potter series. It's yet another example of why Newt is so original and why he works so well in the Fantastic Beast movies. He's a different kind of protagonist in the trio, and this has to be done when adapting a new story to an already existing one, especially one as beloved and complex as Harry Potter. Right you are, Harry. So what about the characters other than Newt? Well, one thing I really liked about this plot was how all of the characters are connected. Most of them start out not knowing each other, but by the end, all of their journeys bring them to the same place. Tina and Credence have an existing relationship, and as do Credence and Graves. Then Newt and Jacob meet in the bank, and as they're leaving, Newt meets Tina. Then there's the classic moment that all good stories have when the core group of heroes comes together. Paralleling so many fantastic stories, the best example I can think of is The Wizard of Oz. Along the way, we also meet the Shaw family and the Makuza president. Then in the end, all of these characters meet in one place for this epic showdown. It shows how each character ties in with the others, and you can almost see this chart that connects all of them, and it proves how important each character is to the story. In my first video for this movie, I had said that the Shaw family was an unnecessary addition and that they made the film feel cluttered, but upon re-watching and looking deeper into the story, I actually realized that they play a vital part in this film. They play three major roles. One, they represent exactly what the Wizarding World in America feared. They were in the business of newspapers, a business that reaches many people and could easily spread the word of magic like wildfire. The Shaw family are the reason why wizards in America are so scared of interacting with muggles. Do you know anything about the wizarding community in America? I do know a few things actually. I know that you have rather backwards laws about relations with non-magic people. The second purpose for the Shaw family is what's in store for the future. I think they're going to play a big role in the future of the series, because as we learned in the crimes of Grindelwald, Jacob remembered magic because it was a happy time for him. The potion only erases bad memories. I didn't have any. 
And as we see, Langdon Shaw is happy when he sees magic because it's the first time his father sees he's right about something, when his father had disregarded him all his life and earlier in the film about magic, which in itself explores the complexities of family relationships that I really found fascinating. But because Langdon was happy when he saw magic, he too will remember it and will probably play a large role in the rest of the series. The third reason why the Shaw family is important is because they help develop and shed a mystery aspect on Credence's character. Here you go, freak. Why don't you put that in the trash where you all belong? Henry Shaw calling Credence a freak was a big moment because it set this idea in Credence's head and was one of the things that set him off. And then seeing Credence kill Henry was one thing that explained why Credence was able to live past the age of 10 while every other Obscurial died before that age. So because Credence has control over it enough to kill those that wronged him, it explains why the Obscurial did not take him over and destroy him. This also turns Credence's tragic story into a story of revenge, which I found very compelling and one of the strongest character arcs in the movie. His arc in this movie is fascinating because we see him interact with many of the main characters, and every time the characters interact with him, there are huge outcomes that deeply affect the plot, whether it be Tina losing her job for helping him, or Grindelwald's interactions with Credence, which pushes his sense of power forward and creates the villain arc for the story. This shows how important Rowling made Credence's character, which is fitting because he's probably the most powerful character in the series. Another character that is key to the story is Jacob. He is the key to seeing something we've never seen before, a muggle interacting with wizards, which as I said was a story arc we hadn't really seen yet. It adds a new dynamic to the story being told, and Jacob actually helps develop the other heroes in the story as well. For Nude, he brings him out of his shell and out of his comfort zone. Because you're my friend. And I'll never forget how you helped me, Jacob. For Tina, Jacob makes her see that the rules aren't always right, and she eventually accepts this as she breaks the biggest rule wizards have in America, having contact with muggles. She grows to care for Jacob and sees that Makuza was wrong. And of course, with Queenie, Jacob gives her a reason to fall in love, and I love how it sort of breaks the norms of couples in movies, having this short fat guy with this beautiful skinny girl. And instead of Queenie being this damsel in distress, she's actually the one to save Jacob, again breaking the norms, which I love to see. Their relationship also parallels the classic story of Romeo and Juliet, two people from different worlds who are forbidden to be with each other. It is not an easy task to have us like these characters in a world where we've already fallen in love with existing characters. We automatically dislike these new characters, even if it's subconsciously, because we miss the old characters. But for me, this was not the case here. I enjoyed watching these characters from the start, especially because each one has a unique and interesting backstory that affects the way they act, whether it be Tina who lost her job, Jacob who was struggling financially and was denied his dream job of running a bakery, and going even further back, Queenie and Tina growing up as orphans. I love how you feel Tina and Queenie's relationship more than you see it. That was a clever bit of writing on Rowling's part. Their relationship is very much based on Rowling and her real life sister Di. They're opposites, as Tina is uptight and all about the rules, while Queenie is more carefree. Queenie is an interesting character as well, especially with her mind reading. Though she can read minds, she doesn't always draw the right conclusions from what she's reading, and it's a very interesting and dynamic flaw for a character to have. Oh, I'm sorry. Can't help it. People are easiest to read when they're hurting. And it's not just Queenie that's dynamic. All of the characters are, and they're so dynamic that I instantly fell in love with each of them. And to be honest, I didn't really miss the characters from Harry's story because I was interested to learn more about these new characters, which just shows how well Rowling made this movie stand on its own. And while we're on the topic of characters, let's talk about the villain, which is arguably one of the most important aspects of any story. Going with Grindelwald was a great decision, because he's the one character that links us to the original series, at least for this movie. In the second film, we have Dumbledore, but for now, we're just focusing on the first movie. It was smart to have this link to the original series be a character that we know of, but don't know a lot about. I'll be honest, the first time I watched this movie, I did not put together that Graves was Grindelwald. Seeing him give Credence the Deathly Hallows necklace, a logo that we knew from the original series was Grindelwald's mark, it made me think that Graves was just one of Grindelwald's followers, so that twist was really well done. And as was the twist of Credence being the Obscurial, these twists are classic JK Rowling. In my opinion, I think that the twists in this film were better than any of the ones that we saw in the seven books. The only one that might rival it in my opinion is the serious black twist in the third book. Only one would die tonight. 
Knowing that Graves was Grindelwald and re-watching some scenes, it adds so much, especially during his interrogation of Newt. It shows how manipulative Grindelwald is, and when he mentions Dumbledore being fond of Newt, you can hear almost jealousy in his voice. What makes Albus Dumbledore so fond of you? Then when Newt mentions the greater good, Mass slaughter for the greater good, you mean? The line that Grindelwald and Dumbledore came up with many years ago. He really takes a moment and thinks about it, almost reminiscing. It's incredible writing, acting, and direction, hitting the mark on all fronts. I think one of the reasons why this film was able to do so much was because of those behind the camera who were in no way new to the Harry Potter franchise. David Yates, the director of the final four Harry Potter films returns, and as does his editor Mark Day, who I have praised in several videos. Yates was able to give us something fresh, new, and special, and I think it really made a difference that he didn't have to follow already existing source material that was crucial to how he tackled directing. Letting Yates go free is when he does his best work, and I think that really shows here not only with some great cinematography and camera movement, but just in the way he's able to use his direction to bring out the best in everybody working on the film. And next to Yates, we have producers David Heyman and Steve Clovis return as well, both of whom played large roles in almost all of the Harry Potter movies. And we also have Stuart Craig, the set designer who's behind the look of Hogwarts and many other sets. And most of all, we have JK Rowling in the writer's chair. Say what you will about Rowling. I've said plenty and have shared my not so great thoughts on her recent behavior on Twitter, but I have to admit, she is a very good writer, especially for Harry Potter, and having her back in the writer's chair was something that had to be done if it's Harry Potter related. We learned that from the cursed child. Rowling made the world of Harry Potter expand so much through this movie, and it's one of the things that makes it so great. We meet new creatures, new characters, have old creatures return, have characters that were mentioned in the original series but that we never saw, and we get a huge expansion on the Wizarding World outside of Europe, and we get an idea of what the Wizarding World was like 70 years before Harry's time. But on top of all of that, it's also able to be very original. You have to remember that this is all new for JK too, because she was used to writing the books by herself with no one even being able to look at the story, not even her husband. But here, she had to work with a team of people not only during the writing process, but for the entire plot, which extends to what the characters look like, how they act, what the fight scenes look like, what the creatures look like, what the locations look like, and so on. She couldn't just write and explain all of that, she had to work with people and make it come to life. Rowling was also able to make this a self-contained story while at the same time setting the groundwork for a 5 film movie series and on top of that, make it a good prequel to the original series. And I think this film delivered on all three of these fronts, a clear indication that this movie is done right by the original Potter books. Another thing that I think made this movie so great was how it wasn't afraid to hold back. This film gets pretty dark, dealing with many adult themes, which is fitting because we're no longer on a journey with kids, we're with adults. The darkest thing I think it dealt with was child abuse, which was sort of touched upon with the Dursleys mentally, but not to this extent where Mary Lou Barebone literally puts her hands on all of the kids in her orphanage, especially Credence. She beats all those kids she's adopted, but she seems to hate him the most. I think the whole Barebone arc was very different from Rowling's other work. Even just hearing these manipulated and beaten kids sing these creepy songs that Mary Lou put in their head, it sort of gave this horror movie vibe that the original series never really had. I'm glad I rewatched this film because when taking a deeper look at the story, it's very compelling and has a solid story arc, solid characters, both heroes and villains, and it expands on the larger Wizarding World a great deal. I think the characters in this movie were the strongest aspect of the film, which is vital when making the first in any series. Rowling has always been good with character development and that really shines through with these new characters. Overall, I think that this is a solid addition to the Harry Potter franchise, and my hope is that this video will shed some light on why this movie is so great and why fans should be more open to this new Wizarding World series. Thank you so much for watching, guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and more of this little dude. If you like this video, hit that like button and subscribe. I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.